All right. Uh, it's getting hot out here. I better hurry up and knock these out. This is uh, part three. We're going to be looking at uh, sort of chemical properties of water, the important stuff that's going to influence fish. I want to talk about pH, alkalinity, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. Talk about these things for a week each, um, but we're going to talk about them very quickly. In fact, the first three we're going to talk about right now, quickly. pH um, is always important. pH affects a lot of chemical reactions. Uh, in general, below 4 and above 11 is going to kill a fish. As you approach these levels, it's going to stress the fish out. Uh, pH is most important, though, in relationship to other chemical reactions. We'll talk about some of those in the next one. Alkalinity is the buffering capacity of the lake water. So how much it resists a change in pH. And so if you come from somewhere that's got a lot of limestone uh, in the watershed, then you're going to have very high alkalinity. It's going to buffer well. So you won't get big swings in pH. Whereas in other watersheds, you might get very large swings in pH uh, even as the sun goes up and comes down. And of course, again, you know, we said pH can affect the fish, it can affect other reactions, so that's something to think about. Uh, carbon dioxide, you know, carbon dioxide, of course, is very important. Uh, it's very important to the algae. Uh, they need to fix the carbon dioxide, uh, to create the biomass for the rest of the organisms. Um, uh, we could talk about this for a long time. What we want to talk about as far as fish goes, it is a weak acid. And so as carbon dioxide builds up, the pH does drop. And when we talk about hauling fish, this is something that we're going to talk about. Um, and this, of course, is again related to alkalinity. If you've got high alkalinity, then the pH does not change as much as the carbon dioxide gets pumped in. Um, it can be used as a fish anesthetic. About 100 parts per million will anesthetize a fish. And then if you put them back in fresh water, they'll come out of it. Um, Higher than this, like 250 parts per million, you can use to uh, euthanize a fish. Uh, carbon dioxide competes for binding sites on hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is designed to carry oxygen to the tissues, pick up carbon dioxide, and carry it back to the gills or to the lungs or whatever. Um, so as carbon dioxide goes up, it sort of cuts the effective concentration of oxygen. And so you might be measuring a relatively high concentration of oxygen, but the carbon dioxide is competing for binding sites, so that's just something to keep in mind. But let's talk about oxygen. This is the most important of these. This is the one that that will, uh, you know, could kill, if you lose oxygen, you can kill a fish very quickly, obviously. Um, so we spend a lot of time talking about oxygen when we talk about fish. In a lake, most of the oxygen in the lake comes from the phytoplankton, not from the air. You can get some to diffuse into the upper layer of the lake from the air, but it does not happen very quickly. And so you're relying upon those phytoplankton and other plants in the water to produce that oxygen, but it's mostly phytoplankton. The macrophytes, the plants that grow along the shoreline in the littoral zone, don't really have that huge of an influence on oxygen in most lakes. It's the phytoplankton. So let's talk about uh, gas in general, oxygen in particular, and water. Does warm water hold more or less oxygen than cold water? When we're talking about gases, as water warms up, it holds less gas. So warmer water has less oxygen in it. But that's a total bummer for the fish because at warmer water temperatures, they're poikilothermic, they're uh, ectothermic for the most part, their body temperature elevates, their respiration goes up, and so they need more oxygen in warm water, but this is when the water holds the least amount of oxygen. So this is why warm water temperature summer is the most stressful time for a fish. And when we talk about hauling fish, again, we'll... Um, talk about this point a little bit. So we said that that oxygen comes from the phytoplankton. 
And so as the sun comes up, the phytoplankton start to photosynthesize, start to give off oxygen. The phytoplankton are living organisms too. They're aerobic organisms. And they require oxygen just like we require oxygen, just like fish requires oxygen, just like any, just about everything requires oxygen. And so the phytoplankton are consuming oxygen, but when the sun's up, they're producing way more than they consume. So there's a net increase in the oxygen when the sun comes up. But when the sun goes down, they stop photosynthesizing and they stop producing oxygen. Yet, everything is still consuming oxygen. And so what you're hoping for is that during the day, an excess of oxygen is produced that will carry you through the night. And then when the sun comes up, you start producing oxygen again. But of course, that's not guaranteed to happen. And if you don't produce enough oxygen during the day, you can go anoxic, and that's when you get fish kills, that's when you get problems with your lake. Oxygen is constantly being consumed. And of course, like we said, most of the organisms that live in a lake are poikilothermic ectotherms, and so they don't make their own uh, heat and their body temperature varies. So as the water temperature goes up, the oxygen consumption goes up a lot higher. So who are we talking about? Who specifically consumes oxygen in a lake? Well, a lot of groups. Of course the fish. But fish, um, relative to the other organisms, do not consume that much oxygen. You know, they're at the top of the food web. There's not uh, as much energy available to them, so they're just not as much biomass as some of the other things. They're not as productive as some of the other levels. But now if we're talking about hauling in an enclosed system, then yes, the fish can consume a significant amount of oxygen. But in a lake, the fish aren't the big consumers. Phytoplankton are big consumers. They're small, they're productive. Like I said, they're producing oxygen when the sun's up, but they're always also consuming oxygen, and there are a lot of them. Inverts. A lot of inverts use the water. And these are not producing any oxygen, but they are consuming, and there's a lot of them. They're very productive. And then the one that we don't think about a lot, but is probably maybe the most important, um, the bacteria. So you've got, you know... Uh, so uh, there's tons of different bacteria species. Um, you've got all these bacteria and inverts down in the benthos that are consuming the dead organic matter. And as they do that, they use up oxygen. The bacteria are everywhere. They're very prolific. They're very productive. And so bacteria are also consuming a lot of oxygen. So all these organisms are always consuming oxygen. And like I said, we hope to produce enough when the sun is up to... Uh, uh, you know, comp to, to take care of them all. Um, so respiration of all these organisms removes oxygen. And, you know, the bacteria, the inverts, the fish are important, but the phytoplankton seem to drive this more than any. So I guess maybe we could, we could argue that the, the bacteria aren't quite as important as the phytoplankton just because maybe the phytoplankton have a larger biomass. But if you get too much, if you get a lot of phytoplankton, that sounds like a good thing from a fish point of view. Because you got a lot of phytoplankton, they're going to produce a lot of oxygen, they're going to fix a lot of carbon, which means a lot of food for everything else, which means the fish will have more potential food. But you can go too far. And if you get too many phytoplankton, at night, when the sun goes down, photosynthesis shuts off, respiration keeps going, you've got this huge biomass of phytoplankton, they can consume all the oxygen. So in very productive lakes that are very green, we often have problems with fish kills. And you think, how can that be? They're producing so much oxygen. Yes, but they're also consuming so much. And when you've got high productivity, uh, you've got a lot of death, and so you've got a lot of phytoplankton dying and going to the bottom where the bacteria consume them. So again, maybe it's the bacteria that are driving this. It doesn't really matter. Between the phytoplankton and the bacteria, if you've got a lot of productivity, you get a lot of oxygen consumption. If that persists at night when you're not replacing that oxygen, you can get a fish kill. 
Uh, we talked about how temperature stratifies. Oxygen can stratify too. And temperature stratification is important because fish like certain temperatures. Oxygen stratification is really important because fish need oxygen. Let's talk about oxygen stratification. This is just a sketch of a typical summer oxygen curve. And we call this a clinograde curve. Again, depth on the y-axis with surface at the top going down to the bottom of the lake and then oxygen on the upper axis. Um, and you can see that at the surface of the lake you've got high oxygen levels, then it drops off rather rapidly, and then down at the hypolimnion you have basically, sometimes you, you go anoxic, you don't have any oxygen. Well, why is it shaped like this? Well, where is oxygen being produced? In the epilimnion, in the euphotic zone, at the surface where there's light. No oxygen being produced down at the bottom in the hypolimnion, but again, all that organic rain, all that waste product, all that dead organic matter is coming down and being consumed by bacteria. And as the bacteria respire and consume that, they're using up oxygen, but the oxygen does not get replaced. And again, it's summer, so the epilimnion and the hypolimnion don't mix, so you can't mix that oxygen up here down with the hypolimnion down there. So one explanation. Sometimes you can get what's known as an orthograde curve, though. Well, that's weird. You have actually higher oxygen down at the hypolimnion relative to the epilimnion. Can you think of how that could happen? I'm imagining you pausing this, discussing it with your friends. Well, I'll give you one way that this could happen. This is in a less productive lake where you don't have a lot of photosynthesis. There's not a lot of nutrients. There's not a lot of phytoplankton. And so you don't produce a lot of oxygen at the surface. But oxygen still gets consumed. You know, there are phytoplankton, there are zooplankton, there are inverts, there are fish. And you don't get this huge surplus of oxygen. But because you don't have a whole lot of phytoplankton, a whole lot of fish, you don't have a whole lot of organic rain. So you don't have a whole lot of decomposition down at the bottom. And so there's really n nothing, no bacteria consuming things to suck up oxygen. Um, so the oxygen just kind of stays there at the bottom until fall turnover. So I sort of gave this away, but the question is, which of these lakes is more productive? And the answer is the Kleinograde curve is a more productive lake. Because again, you can see it's producing a lot of oxygen at the surface, and then things are dying, lots of biomass sinking down to the bottom where that gets consumed and uses up oxygen. And the orthograde one, you don't produce a lot of oxygen, you don't produce a lot of biomass, there's not a lot of decomposition. Orthograde, you know, um, low productivity lakes, oligotrophic lakes, are often. Um, the oxygen is defined more by physical chemistry. That's something else I should mention. You've got the cooler water in the hypolimnion. Cool water can hold more oxygen than hot water. And so it's the, the physical properties, the temperature that's driving the oxygen curve. Whereas in a more productive eutrophic lake, it's the biology and the phytoplankton, the bacteria that are driving the oxygen curve. And those are a couple terms you need to know. A low productivity lake is called oligotrophic. A high productivity lake is called a eutrophic. Somewhere in the middle you get a mesotrophic. Sometimes you see these lakes that are very crazy productive and they call them hyper eutrophic. Um, I'm not really sure, but I think Kentucky Lake is considered mesotrophic. And here's a funny one that you sometimes get. It's called a heterograde curve where you get this big bump of oxygen about halfway down, or a couple meters down. What do you think could cause that? Again, pausing, talking to your friends. Well, let me superimpose a typical temperature curve over this. Remember that summer stratification temperature curve? 
where you've got the epilimnion and then the metalimnion and the hypolimnion. And you often see this oxygen bump that coincides right with the bottom of the epilimnion, top of the metalimnion. Remember, this is a radical change in density right there. And so probably what's happening is that phytoplankton are sinking, but then they're all stopping at the top of the metalimnion. The density is so great they can't sink anymore. But light can still reach the metalimnion, so they just sit there and photosynthesize. So they produce a ton of oxygen right there at the metalimnion. Um, that's one explanation of this. Okay, so we need to kind of have a rule of thumb for fish and oxygen levels. In a lake, five to 10 parts per million, which is the same as milligrams per liter, that's pretty typical in the epilimnion of most lakes. That's the range that you're gonna see out there. Hypolimnion, very possible to go all the way down to zero. That's not uncommon in a stratified lake. If you've got a very productive eutrophic lake at noon or say two o'clock in the summer when the sunlight is intense and it's just cranking and it's eutrophic so there's lots of nutrients, you know, you can get it as high as 15. I've seen as high as 18. But that's when you're getting in that danger zone where it's so eutrophic that you might get a crash at night. Less than four parts per million kills some species and definitely stresses out the ones it does not kill. And fish cannot live below two parts per million. Unless it's an air breather like a gar, bowfin, somebody that can go up and gulp at the surface. So four is where you start getting into that uh, I'm worried zone. Okay, um, so that is just basic, uh, some chemical stuff. That's the most important ones. Of course, oxygen being the most important. I got one more section to do. It's a little bit more chemistry, but it's stuff that's not quite as critical as oxygen. So I'll see you back in a little bit and later.